Oh gosh, look at the crowd. Come this way. Those who spread goodness radiate happiness to everyone around them. Introducing LOLC Finance Credit Cards. Fuel the goodness in you. Welcome to LMD TV. I'm Ashwini Vedakan. Joining us this week on Talking Business is the Global Chairperson for Women in Logistics and Transport, Gayani Dialvis. Welcome to the show, Gayani. It's good to have you with us. Thank you very much for having me, Ashwini. Now, Gayani, could you outline the factors that facilitate Sri Lanka's aspirations to upgrade itself into a key logistics hub in South Asia from a transshipment hub? Okay. Thank you. I think this is something that we all have been talking about for quite a long time. And successive governments, whenever they come into power, this is one thing that they all seem to be agreeing. But nevertheless, although we are blessed with the strategic positioning, unfortunately, we still haven't really made, uh, make, made it happen, actually. So if you really look at the, our strategic positioning, why are we saying that we can become a logistics hub is, if you look at uh, Sri Lanka's positioning, we are at the busiest east-west route, centrally located between two uh, uh, hubs, right? And we are actually just next to India, the biggest, one of the biggest economies in the world, and we are connected through air and sea uh, very well to India as well. And also, if you look at uh, Sri Lanka, uh, within about 10 to 12 nautical miles of the port of uh, Colombo and Hambantota, we see every day 650 ships passing us. But unfortunately, we only uh, see 10 last year, if you look at the figures, like you know, 10 to 12 ships only have called uh, uh, in Sri Lanka. So there is so much opportunity. And not only that, two thirds of the global oil shipments pass through this route. And one third of the bulk cargo pass this uh, route. And also one third of the global bulk shipping trade, including petroleum products and coal, all that is passing through this route. So it is quite, quite a, a challenging situation, but we have to really make use of this opportunity. Because when these things are happening, why can't Sri Lanka make use of this opportunity? Because as it is now, we are considered a transshipment hub uh, and bulk of our volumes that is um, handled by our ports in Sri Lanka are for transshipment around 85 to 85% and bulk of it is also for the Indian uh, subcontinent. So how do we really make use of this opportunity uh, when there is so much traffic around us? Location advantage is there, traffic is there. We also have a reasonable infrastructure uh, in, in, in our ports and connectivity, uh, you know, multimodal connectivity and, and our road infrastructure. Uh, and of course, relatively uh, uh, quality uh, workforce uh, and with our high literacy rate and all that. And we have all these uh, aspects available uh, in our country. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's, it's just us who should make it actually an opportunity, convert this opportunity uh, and make it a reality for us to, uh, uh, you know, make our aspiration from, from moving from a transshipment hub to a logistics hub. So. And what do you recognize as obstacles for the nation to achieve this dream? See, uh, the obstacles, in terms of obstacles, yes, we are blessed with this strategic positioning. So the, the biggest obstacle that I see, I mean, I'll list out a few things. The biggest obstacle is we don't, we don't have, we have the aspiration, but we don't convert this uh, aspiration into reality. And in terms of uh, policy and the roadmap that we have in place to make this dream a reality, uh, somehow or other get diluted when the governments change. And the, some government who has progressed to a particular uh, uh, level, and then after a while, when a new government comes into power, the whole thing will get reversed. So that's another big issue that we have. Although we all know that successive governments have put all of that in their manifesto. So that's, that's one big problem that we have. So there is no consensus, consensus among the opposition ruling parties, you know, ruling governments and all that. So that's one of the biggest problems that we see in this country. So when there is no cohesive approach, uh, you know, to achieve this uh, 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 ambition, uh, then it, it actually uh, doesn't get realized. The other important uh, part is this policy consistency. 
you know we we keep changing our uh, goal post and then uh, you know therefore even if there are investors who really want to make uh, visit sri lanka and make funding you know those opportunities will not be able to uh, you know realize because there are so much policy inconsistency so we need to understand how do we give that confidence to our uh, external world as to we are a destination where we can country where we can have investment opportunities uh, and even if you look at some of the internal uh, international rankings doing business index uh, logistics performance index our rankings if you really look at it is not really up to the mark now if you recently look at the doing business index uh, which was uh, released last year we were uh, 99 out of 100 and uh, i think 190 we just improved one one ranking there uh, you know then if anybody who is coming to this country to do investment and they will not be able to uh, you know do uh, operations or you know getting something approved you know going going from different uh, uh, going to various government agencies to get approvals all that there is no one stop shop to do that yes boi is there but then still there are lots of uh, you know inefficiencies in the system uh, that prevents uh, these things happening smoothly when you compare with other hubs and also if you look at the logistic performance indicator that is the the most important uh, uh, indicator which is actually uh, determining the logistics friendliness of a country if you read this is the global uh, world bank doing business uh, uh, connect to compete uh, uh, indicator they they look at uh, about uh, six parameters they look at how competitive your border control agency the customs uh, uh, and border control then what about your infrastructure facilities do you have uh, you know state of the art infrastructure facilities to manage the uh, your logistics uh, whole operation and do we have competitive international shipping rates you know whether you are competitive and also whether you have a quality workforce right uh, and do we have a tracking and tracing when you cow cargo uh, is landed uh, container is uh, unloaded and then can we track and trace uh, the end to end your shipment you know the timeliness of delivery how quickly you can clear the cargo of course when you compare with our neighbors we are somewhat uh, better than uh, performance uh, performance wise but anyhow if you look at the global players the, there are other six major transshipment hubs that we are talking about Uh, in our region uh, like you know singapore uh, uh, salala uh, and then you have uh, dubai uh, port kilang south uh, you, uh, saudi arabia so all of these uh, you're competing with these uh, hubs actually so if you are not in a position to compete uh, in these uh, hubs then you will be left behind so you need to actually be on par so if you look at sri lanka's logistics performance indicator we are actually placed at 94 out of 160 so we are considered a partial perform you know the highest level being the logistics friendly country uh, but we are considered a partial perform so we have to really uh, do lot of this is actually based on uh, perception based ranking because they in, interview all the uh, the the stakeholders with the, the countries that are dealing with and they based on that they do the ranking but anyhow our image matters in the eyes of the external world so if we don't properly uh, manage this uh, our logistics efficiencies and the logistics service orientation in the country no point in having our strategic positioning with uh, location advantage and we cannot make use of that opportunity and on that note we'll be going in for a short break Welcome back as we continue our conversation with the global chairperson for women in logistics and transport Gaini Diawis. Now according to a McKinsey report Asia's e-commerce logistics market will take up to 57 total market share by 2025. How should Sri Lanka prepare for this trade growth? Yes, I think this is something that actually uh, was very very uh, 
useful for the Sri Lankan consumers. Because if you really look at Sri Lankan's e-commerce market, it's abysmally low. It's, I think it's around 0.3 to 4% of the total trade, uh, less than 1%. Uh, having said that, although we have a, at a very nascent stage, uh, COVID actually expedited uh, you know, the accelerating this e-commerce market. Although we have bigger players like Africa and all of these big players, but smaller players actually uh, care I mean, moved into this space during the COVID crisis. So that was uh, welcome uh, news to everybody. So what is important for us to understand, the concept of e-commerce is not really understood by uh, most players in the market, you know. So you have the brick and mortar model and then suddenly just having a website doesn't mean that you can, uh, you know, realize your e-commerce ambition. So what is important for us is, Yes, you need to need to have a digitalized platform to do this, but then you need to also make sure the logistics part of it. How do you really manage your fulfillment and the last mile logistics delivery uh, uh, when p consumers place the orders online? And that is where a lot of the companies fail. So what we need to really learn in Sri Lanka is to understand this new trend because most of the companies are not fully moved into a digitalized space. Even we saw how supermarket chains in Sri Lanka uh, struggled even the established players were struggling during the COVID crisis, uh, and because they couldn't cope up with the the demand that actually uh, came with the COVID crisis. But of course, they quickly pivoted and uh, corrected, the rectified the situation. So, what is important for us to understand? First of all, what are the options available? You know, the consumer demand is moving. Consumers want now touchless, more uh, uh, smaller parcel size, frequent deliveries. They want to deliver it to your doorstep. Uh, they want cash on delivery options, different options, uh, uh, credit card, different options. You cannot have a uh, you know, stringent way of managing this e-commerce operation. So you need to be, understand the consumer needs very clearly uh, because we, uh, if you look at the demographies, younger consumers will be quickly able to move into this new uh, uh, e-commerce uh, way of working. But if you look at the older generation, of course, uh, again, during the pandemic, we saw how uh, especially older generation also using WhatsApp and also the industry also quickly, you know, uh, used uh, that they are trained into the WhatsApp mode and all that. So older generation also slowly now have got into this uh, space. So what is important for you is there should be different models to do deliveries. How do you manage your fulfillment? You cannot use the normal logistics operation to manage the e-commerce uh, business. It's a totally a different ball game altogether. In your assessment, Gayani, what has the impact of the Belt and Road Initiative been on the local economy to date? So Belt and Road uh, Initiative, we are lucky actually, we are part of the Belt uh, in the Maritime Road because this Belt and Road Initiative was, uh, was the ancient Silk Route, the trade route when China was uh, trading uh, with Asia and Europe and all that. Uh, so we are strategically positioned there. So therefore, Belt and Road Initiative is something that we will anyway, uh, as being part of the Belt and Road Initiative, we will uh, definitely benefit from that. But, but if you really look at uh, the, the, the port operations, the fact that we have China Merchant Holdings, uh, uh, who's actually now operating our Hambantha report, uh, uh, being there and also the port city that we have now, uh, uh, again, Chinese control. So these two are opportunities for us to capitalize. You know, uh, already, I think uh, two months ago, there was a news item uh, from the, uh, uh, from China Mer my Merchant Holding, uh, partnered with the autom automobile manufacturer from uh, China to do, uh, develop, uh, set up an assembly plant in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, in, a, in our logistics part there. So when you when you are part of this chain, already you see uh, that you yourself is unable to uh, get in tapping into the global supply chain because you don't have the, uh, the, the connections and the network with you. So since you are part of this Belt and Road Initiative, you see a lot of opportunities uh, in, uh, you know, through their companies to you know, tap into the global supply chain network. So that will actually really help us internally in the country uh, to get uh, our local industry component if, if we have facilities and they might also develop 
uh, back, back, backward integration internally, and that will help us to you know get more job opportunities and access to know-how, uh, and also our local uh, industries also will benefit through that. Uh, and, and also, especially uh, with the port city coming into the uh, becoming operational again, uh, that we will also uh, have access to the external world through these investment opportunities that is coming our way. So uh, it is too early for us to comment on that, but signs are that we see, uh, especially in terms of uh, uh, knowledge transfer, uh, connect connectivity, the net, uh, tapping into the global supply networks are some of the things that we see happening. But we also have to be mindful. There are geopolitics issues and all that. Uh, and we need to also make sure that we manage this uh, uh, you know, sensitive situation uh, 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 well, so that to our own advantage, so that we can benefit uh, from being part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Well, this has definitely been an interesting conversation and has shed light into where the logistics sector is heading. Thank you for joining us on the show this evening, Gaini. Thank you, Ashwini. Pleasure. Coming up, we have the latest from Bizwire. Stay tuned. You love the feeling of being renewed. To stay beautiful every single day. To breathe just like we do. Because you are truly delicate. Protecting the ones who've been with us through the years. With Sailac Care, the only wood coating that truly protects you. Sailac Wood Coatings from Jat. Welcome back to the show. Joining us this week on Bizwire is the Chief Financial Officer for Softlogic Life, Nuan Witanage. Welcome to the show, Nuan. It's good to have you with us. Hi, Ashini. Now, Nuan, given the past two years, how has the insurance sector and soft logic life, in your opinion, performed? Very good question, Ashwini. Now, last two years, the uh, industry has performed really well. So, if you look at the uh, life insurance industry, so 2020 industry gave around 16%, and followed by 2021, first nine months industry gave around 20%. So, this shows the growth momentum of the industry. And uh, if you look at first half of 2020, we had a lot of challenges as an industry, and we experienced a substantial drop in the premium collection from the customers, as well as drop in the new business revenue. If you come back to SoftLogic Life, 2020, another successful year we had, we grew around 25% against industry growth of 16%. And not only that, I think uh, SoftLogic Life made a history in the insurance industry of Sri Lanka, and being the only Sri Lankan company who recorded uh, consecutively two years up in our industry rankings. So if we go back to 2019, so we were number fifth and we were able to transform fifth position to fourth position. Followed by 2020, again, we were able to increase our market position another one point and be in the third largest insurer in Sri Lanka. This happened first time history of Sri Lankan insurance industry. So how would you say is SoftLogic Life different from the rest in the industry? Yeah. So uh, that's the key. So because uh, our, we have more innovation-driven culture, that innovation-driven culture help us to introduce a lot of innovation to Sri Lankan insurance industry. And uh, I think some of the key innovation was like we, we, we introduced health insurance proposition to insurance industry in Sri Lanka along with the life insurance benefit. If you look back some time back, life insurance is considered as a death benefit uh, proposition. With this introduction of health insurance benefit, we were able to change the perception about life insurance, where we were able to transform death benefit solutions to more living benefit kind of thing. So where customers feel they can enjoy the benefits when they live and when they pay in the premiums. So that position ourselves in the unique position in the industry, where currently SoftLogic Life become the market lead in health insurance market in Sri Lanka. So not only that, we introduced a lot of innovations that changed the whole landscape of the life insurance market. We brought concept of 80% plus claims in one day. And with using digitization of the market, we brought a lot of digital avenue to life insurance market using the AI and managed ML and the RPA. We digitalized our underwriting and claim practices 
to provide greater benefits to our customers. So how can financial function be innovative and create value in an organization? Yeah, that's also a very good question, Ashwini. Now, finance function is the center to the any business, right? So they provide strategic direction to the company. And where finance function can create value, so they can be the business partner of the business. And uh, nowadays, so finance can understand because being the center of the business, so they are well positioned to understand how the value is created in the business. And, uh, and the CFO of insurance company, I must say, Ashwin, now we will be getting new accounting standard IFRS 17 insurance contract, where, which enhance the information flow to the management, where finance role of business partnering for the enhance. So that perspective, we can create the value. On the other hand, nowadays we have uh, MI, uh, RPA and uh, uh, that kind of latest technology where finance can automate uh, repetitive tasks. Not only that, so using those technology, they can create greater business intelligence. That's how finance can create the value and how that's how they can be the uh, business partnering role of the business. Trust, transparency and authenticity is essential when in the business of insurance. So how important is corporate governance to Softlogic Life and what measures have you taken to ensure it's ma well managed? Yeah, uh, insurance companies also hire regulated companies and uh, we also dealing with the public money. So therefore transparency and corporate governance is key to success in the business. And being the uh, more transparent company, I think we are the only insurance company in Sri Lanka who publish audited uh, quarterly numbers to Colombo Stock Exchange. Not only that, we follow a lot of voluntary guidelines like corporate governance frameworks, integrated reporting governance framework, those are not a mandatory. Also, we go beyond the minimum, uh, beyond the minimum required level of information publications in our annual report to provide better clarity to all the stakeholders, including our customers. And we introduce a lot of innovative things to reporting landscape in Sri Lanka. Like four years back, we introduced video version of annual report. And last year, we introduced assurance report for integrated reporting. Because we believe innovation is must to financial reporting landscape to improve the transparency of financial reporting. And our transparency in financial reporting recognized in many award ceremonies, not only for Sri Lanka, even for South Asian as well as Asian region also. We have received more than 35 awards last seven years, which signify our transparency efforts we have taken last seven years. So how crucial is it for an insurance organization to embrace a transparent culture when working with financial reporting? Yeah, not only for insurance company. So any company transparency is pretty much important. Now, if you look at current situation in the country, I think countries uh, uh, pressurizing to get the foreign currency earnings. To, how to resolve this? So one of the uh, resolution could be is of attracting foreign direct investments. And to attract the foreign investments, so we need to have more transparent financial reporting process. If we go back to 2020, we were able to attract $30 million from two uh, different parties. One is that multinational reinsurer, so Munich Re, uh, we were able to attract 50 million financial reinsurance transactions. On the other hand, we were able to again attract another 15 million from two development fund, Fin Fund and No Fund, which is based on Finland and uh, Norwegian uh, uh, country. So, which we were able to attract because of our transparent financial reporting, I think that is basis to attract the foreign direct investments. How far ahead is Sri Lanka when it comes to integrated financial reporting? I think Sri Lanka came long way. So, last 10 years, so Sri Lanka came long way in financial integrated reporting journey. Currently, around 60 companies head of integrated reporting practices in Sri Lanka. However, I personally feel that there is a long way to go uh, from mere uh, reporting practices to actual reporting practices. Therefore, I think we need to encourage more and more companies to pub publish futuristic information and obtaining assurance report to provide credibility of the information what we provided to market. What do you think the future of the life insurance industry will be like? And how do you see it impacting soft logic life? I must say that future of life insurance industry is pretty much bright. So as you are aware that uh, uh, life insurance market is pretty much under the market in Sri Lanka still. We have penetration level of 0.5%. In 
If we compare this with the emerging country like Thailand, which is having penetration level of 3%, and uh, which has only per capita income $7,000, which is two times than the current level of Sri Lanka. Right, if we can, if we can grow two times uh, than the per capita income, we have six time multiples that currently industry is 700 billion industry. So by, what I'm telling is we can go 600 billion if we can grow our per capita income twice. So where Sophologic Life Portion is most innovative insurer in Sri Lanka, and we have track record of recording more than double the industry growth, we are well positioned to capture and capture this opportunity. Being the Sri Lankan company, we are, we are very keen to serve our citizens, each and every citizen of this country. Therefore, we are well equipped to serve and capitalize this opportunity. Well, this has been an interesting conversation. Thank you for joining us on the show today, Noan. Thank you, Ashani. And that's all the time we have for you this week. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for watching and stay safe.